Welcome to Confessions of a Parent Coach. I'm coach, mother of four, and potty talker, Ann Kaplan. This is the podcast where I confess something from my own parenting and coaching life, teach a lesson around it, and answer your questions. Even we parenting experts are far from perfect, and the real magic happens when we get down with all that imperfection. We get into the gritty side of parenting here, so earbud up and dive in. Hello and welcome back into the podcast, listener. I'm so excited to be here with you again for another episode of the podcast. And this week, I'm kind of piggybacking on a previous email, not a previous episode, but a previous email that I sent out um, a few weeks ago. I sent out an email to my list, which if you're not on my list, you should get on my list so that you can get these amazing emails. Every Tuesday, I send out an email that is all about some parenting topic, some parenting tip, something that's kind of like what you're getting in the podcast, but obviously written. So it's a visual thing that you're going to do. And also just a few minutes, right? Because how long does it take you to read an email? So you should totally get on that list. And the email that I sent out a few weeks ago was what are the hallmarks of a good consequence? What makes a good consequence? We talked about like the three cornerstones of a good consequence which I've talked about on this podcast also. And the way that I talked about those three hallmarks was to talk about a question I had gotten in my group program, which was, what do you do when your kid puts their clothes all over the floor instead of in the hamper? Well, <laughs> every time that I send out an email, my amazing assistant, Jody turns it into um, a really beautiful blog post and she sh shares the blog post out on social media and all of this stuff. And this time when she did it, she put that question, what do you do when a kid puts her clothes on the floor instead of in the hamper as kind of like the start of the post that went out on Facebook and Instagram. Holy cow, you guys, so much traction, so much resistance, so much like drama around this one question that I started getting, well, first of all, inspired to make this podcast episode, but also like pissed. And that is my confession for you this week is sometimes I get way too emotionally tied up in my work. Sometimes the stuff that other parents do and say really pushes my buttons. And that totally happened with this. So I'm actually going to read to you a couple of the comments that really inspired me to be like, you know what? We really need to talk about this. All joking aside, all, you know, being irritated aside, all that stuff. Forget about that. This is really important. Okay, so here are a couple of the comments that I got that were really like, whoa. So somebody said, why focus on consequences? It's the kid's room. How does it being messy hurt your hurt the parent? There's a door, close it and let the kid have their space. Consequences are just a nice word for punishment. Most of the time, it's barter for the child. If I do this thing my parent doesn't like, it costs me this. And maybe this is worth that. It doesn't teach values, cooperation, or internal motivation. I don't think compliance is the ultimate goal. Now, I get feedback like this all the time because I run an ad on Facebook all the time for my free workbook, which is called Getting Kids to Listen the First Time. And people, it is so fascinating to see what people read into just the title, Kids Who Listen the First Time. And in this case, on in, in this particular blog post, same thing. It's so interesting to see what people read into when you use the word consequence, like this person, this particular commenter went off to the races about what does it mean when we give a kid a consequence? You can see the assumptions that are inherent in this comment on my post. First assumption is that consequences are about getting compliance from our kids, that consequences are really don't teach any of these things, that consequences are really punishments, that consequences don't teach um, things like internal motivation, values or cooperation, all of those things. And a little bit of, I would say, saltiness about even wanting your house to be clean, <laughs> apparently. So all of that stuff, I'm not, I, it's, it's useless to go into this granular level about this one particular mom who commented on my post. That's totally useless to all of us. But what is really useful is to look at 
what do we think consequences mean? And what are our kind of knee jerk stories that we're telling ourselves in our head about consequences? Because consequences, I'm telling you right now, are super important. And if you've listened to past episodes, I've talked about boundaries, how boundaries are super important in your relationship. I want to ask you this. How do you enforce a boundary in a relationship? I'm going to make the assumption that everybody who's listening to this has already listened to these podcasts about boundaries and stuff like that. So I'm not going to waste our time reiterating on this particular episode why boundaries are important. I'm just going to assume that we all agree boundaries are important. Okay, great. Not only are boundaries important, we all agree that boundaries are actually necessary in any relationship. So if that's the case, how do you enforce a boundary? And we don't even need to be talking about a parent-child relationship, right? Any relationship where you set a boundary. Let's say you set a boundary with your partner, which is, you know, um, of course, now I can't think of anything, right? Doesn't that always happen, right? Like, uh, let's see, what's a boundary that I've set with Mike? Um, I've set a boundary that I'm not going to get involved in stuff between him and his mom um, when he's got drama or like him and anyone in his family when there's drama in his family. That's a boundary that I've set. And we actually both have set boundaries for us, for each of us in our relationship in terms of like whatever battles you have with a family member, including my family. So if Mike has a battle with my family, that's between him and that person in my family, even if that person's in my family. So there's a boundary that we we have in our relationship. Well, how can I enforce that boundary? If Mike comes to me and starts saying, which this has not happened. I'm, this is a total hypothetical. I'm putting that out there, especially since we have family that listens to this podcast. This has not actually happened. This is a complete hypothetical. But if Mike came to me and was like, you know, my mom, blah, 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 really pissed me off or my sister, such and such. And now I'm really angry about it. And I want you to talk to my mom for me. I think you should call my sister and tell her what's what, or I don't think that you should do X, Y, and Z for, for my mom, because you should be like on my side. And so, you know, I don't want you being nice to her or whatever. Once again, if you know my husband, you would know how preposterous this um, hypothetical is because Mike would never behave this way, but I've committed now. So I'm going down the rabbit hole with it. Okay. So let's say he did that to me. He came to me and was like, you need to fight this battle for me or with me. I need you to be in my corner. And that means doing all of these things and, and fighting for me and advocating for me and going to the mats for me. Well, I've already set a boundary that I'm not going to do that. How do I enforce that boundary? One thing is that I have to stick to what I said. I'm not going to do it. No matter how much you ask me, no matter how much you're angry with me that I'm not doing what you want me to do, I'm going to follow my own boundaries and not do something that violates this boundary that I've set for myself. But also, what if you just keep coming at me? What if like every time we're hanging out together, the conversation turns this way and we start having fights and we're super angry and it's like this drama in our relationship? Here's where I get to this point about consequences being a really important part in your relationship. Like there's a consequence to that. There is a consequence to my husband badgering me and, you know, coming at me around this boundary that I have. And that is that I might say, you know what, I'm not going to talk to you about this any longer and walk away. Or I think I really need to take space from you until you're, you know, over this thing with your family and give us some distance. I might literally stop a conversation and walk away mid conversation and say, you know what, this is not where I want to go. If I continue to be in this conversation, I'm going to be way too upset. So I am leaving. That is a perfectly logical and important consequence to help me enforce my boundary that I have set up in this relationship. So the whole reason why I use this analogy instead of a parent-child analogy is to illustrate the fact that consequences exist all the time. Consequences are not a manipulation tool. Consequences are not a power play. Consequences are not about controlling someone who's weaker than you. Do parents try to use consequences that way? Hell yeah, they do. And guess what? Then they're not using consequences. They are using punishments, which is exactly what this one commenter said. And my my response to her was like, I completely agree on that. A lot of people say consequence, but they really mean punishment. What she might not have realized in her comment is that she also means punishment when she says consequence. Because if you're using consequences in a healthy way that truly is about enforcing your boundary in a relationship, 
it is not punitive and it's not about controlling the other person. It is not about getting compliance. It is not something that is um, domineering or or even puts you on a different level than the person that you're setting this boundary and enforcing it with consequences. It, that's not what consequences really are. And because of that, the part that I truly disagree with is when she said, it, they don't teach values, cooperation, or internal motivation. If you are actually using consequences healthily, if you are using consequences as a way to enforce your boundaries in a relationship with someone healthily, not codependently, not controlling, all of that stuff, consequences totally do teach internal motivation. For example, in the analogy with Mike, you know, being all codependent with me about drama with his family. Me saying, hey, you know what? That's your fish to fry, not mine. And I am not going to get into this with you. I'm not going to jump in the pool with you. I'm standing firm in my boundary. And in fact, I'm going to enforce my boundary by giving you the consequence of walking away when you do not respect my boundary. Over time, and probably quite quickly, this person is going to realize like, oh, I guess this is my problem to deal with, not this other person's problem. Oh my gosh. Wow. Internal motivation. Right. And what was the other thing that she said? Values or cooperation. Then once again, disagree. Being in a relationship with someone who exemplifies and models self-care, self-respect, dignity, enforcing boundaries that way, absolutely models values. It models the fact that you are living and walking not to get too woo-woo sounding, a righteous life. And children learn best through two ways, modeling and experiences. When you enforce your boundary by giving a loving, calm, healthy consequence to your child, you are doing both. You are giving them an experience of what happens when they make XYZ decision. And you are also modeling for them how to show up in the world in a way that is both caring about yourself and other people. So if consequences, if you find yourself falling into this pitfall that so many people do of equating consequences with punishment, of believing that there's consequences to, um, you know, to do, to, to use that will control and manage and get your child to do something. First of all, you're so normal. Almost all of us do that. And it's really important to check yourself and take a step back and remind yourself like, we're not this, that's all punishing what you're thinking about, what we all, our default thought process about being in relationship with our children is a punitive default, almost all of us. So if you start feeling like icky about using consequences, if you start feeling like I need to find a consequence that will get my kid to do blah you are not really thinking about consequences anymore. And it's important to kind of, like I said, check yourself and step back and realize like, oh, hang on a second. I'm falling into some, some old worldviews. What's actually true is that consequences are really almost the only way that we can enforce boundaries. So I, I challenge this mom or anybody who has these comments or feelings about some of the stuff that we talk about when it comes to boundaries and consequences how do you enforce a boundary with a child without a consequence? How can it even be possible to enforce a boundary? Let's say your boundary is, uh, you know, um, screen time is for kids who don't do their chores. Well, what happens if your kid is watching TV and you realize they haven't done their chores? What are you supposed to do? You got to enforce that boundary. How do you enforce that boundary without giving a consequence? Any possible thing that you think to do in response to your child's choice to cross your boundary is a consequence, unless you do it out of anger, out of, you know, spite, out of trying to control them. Now it's a punishment. So the choice isn't to consequence or not to consequence. The choice is to punish or to consequence. And my assertion always is punishment, punitive parenting doesn't work consequences are the way to go. And then we can start thinking about, okay, well, what consequence makes sense? Just like this mom who first asked her question, what's a good consequence for a kid who doesn't put their clothes in the hamper? Now, if you don't care if your kid puts your clothes in the hamper, you wouldn't have asked me the question in the first place, but you do care. And you're allowed to care about the stuff that you care about. 
you would like to have a boundary in your family about clothes belonging in the hamper, guess what? You get to decide that. And then you get to decide how you're going to enforce that boundary. And just like this mom's gut was telling her, I need a consequence to be able to enforce that boundary. Otherwise, you have no boundaries. Consequences are the only thing that actually make boundaries real and have them actually exist. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of lip service. You have to put your clothes in the hamper. And then a kid doesn't put their clothes in the hamper and then nothing happens to them. And then when mom said you have to put your clothes in the hamper, that was just words. That wasn't a boundary. That was just at best a like empty talk at worst, a straight up lie to say you have to put your clothes in the hamper and then do nothing to enforce that boundary is basically saying like, hey, when I said you had to put your clothes in the hamper, that actually was false. I was lying. <laughs> so now I think if you take a, the long view of some of these perspectives that were shared in response to this question, I think what also is being said isn't necessarily consequences are bad or why do we have consequences, but there's a lot of stuff that we get hung up on as parents that we really don't need to set a boundary around. And that is 100% true. It is a topic for another podcast episode. But in essentially, I really wanted to record this episode today because it's so important for us to understand, well, first of all, a boundary is only as powerful as the enforcement of that boundary. So if you're not willing to enforce a boundary, it's really not a boundary. And then we get to the point of like, okay, well, how do we enforce boundaries? The only healthy way to enforce boundaries is consequences. That is my take on it. And if you disagree, awesome. I want to hear about it right into the podcast, go to my website and kaplanparentcoach.com. Use that contact form to submit your question or criticism or whatever. And I will totally read it on the podcast and talk about it because spirited debate is my jam. I love that stuff. So bring it. I'm here for it. I'm totally ready to receive. And until I've been, you know, persuaded otherwise, my assertion has always been and will co and continues to be boundaries are crucial enforcement of boundaries are the only way that boundaries actually are boundaries and that consequences are the only healthy way to enforce those boundaries so i hope that's helpful for you today and the last little tip i'm going to give you when it comes to consequences and punishments and boundaries and all these buzzwords that we keep talking about is when you start thinking okay what's the right consequence for this situation ask yourself Am I doing this because I'm trying to control my kid? Because if the answer to that question is yes, you got your own homework to do before you even sit down and figure out what that consequence is. Because what you might be saying is what's the right consequence, but what you're actually thinking is what consequence will get my kid to do what I want them to do. And now we're back in that whole punitive controlling compliance, yucky, swampy quagmire that we don't want to be in. So hope that's helpful for you today. Going to finish up with a question from the listener. And this one is not necessarily super related to this topic, but it just really touched my heart and I wanted to share it. So this mom says, is gender disappointment a real thing? I'm feeling it and it's weighing heavy on me. I know I should be happy with anything as long as it's alive and healthy, but I'm just feeling so down. So this mama is by the way, an anonymous listener. So I do not have a name for you, but I'm still sending you a ginormous hug over the airwaves. Um, so this mama is pregnant and is finding out that she's having whatever gender of baby she was hoping not to have, um, or I should say whatever sex of baby she was choose hoping not to have and not having the sex of baby that she was hoping for. And the first part of this question is, is gender disappointment a real thing? Like, well, obviously it's a real thing. You're living it right now. You feel disappointed about what your gender reveal showed you, which means it's real. You feel it. It's real. I get questions all the time of like, are my feelings valid? Is it normal to feel this? Is it okay that I feel this way? Is this feeling real? Like this mom asked so many questions like this that really reveal how much we don't trust ourselves to just honor what's going on inside of us. And without question, without judgment, just to say like, this is how I feel right now. So the first answer to your question is simply, yes, 
gender disappointment is a real thing. Even if it has never existed before in the history of the universe, the fact that you're feeling it means it's a real thing. And it has existed before in the history of the universe. You're not the first person to feel this way. And I actually felt this way myself. I always wanted to have a daughter. I just fantasized about it in my head. And ever since I was a little girl, I wanted a little girl. And I joke often that I, I have four kids and I always say, I wanted a girl all four times. And we didn't have that. So our first kiddo was a boy and we did not find out the gender. And then our second kiddo came out. Um, oh, sorry. Our second kiddo, when we, I got pregnant, I was like, okay, I'm going to find out. Cause I know that I really am hoping to have a little girl. And if, um, if I don't have one, I'm going to be disappointed. And so we did the ultrasound and we found out that it was a boy and I was right. I was very disappointed. I was very sad for probably like three or four days. I was just really down in the dumps and I cried and it was like a morning. It was a little bit of a morning because this imaginary girl in my head was not imaginary to me. And then when my son was born, the second he came out and I saw him, I was just like, I can't believe I ever wanted him to be anything different than what he was. He is perfect. And I was crazy. That was my personal experience when he was born. So I felt really grateful that I had found out in advance so that I could get my mind drama over with before he was born and really just meet him who he was in the moment and parent him and be his mom without any of my, my own hangups um, weighing on me. So not only is gender disappointment real, even me, this parenting guru person, supposedly, <laughs> anyway, has felt it too. And that being said, I think, especially in today's day and age, it's very um, challenging to have a conversation about gender like this without um, acknowledging that you don't really know the gender of your baby. Um, you might know what their anatomy is, but we don't know what the gender of our kids are until they figure that out. And even if you do know, like, even if like in my case, all three or all four of my kids identify with their ana anatomy and we have not had, um, any transgender, um, uh, experiences in our, you know, um, uh, oh my God, what's the word nuclear family. But, um, but even so, that doesn't mean I know who my kid is, right? Just because I know, like, my assumption that they're a boy was accurate doesn't mean that I know who this kid is. And this that is a very, very clear um, experience that I had with my first two kids. Like, I think one of the reasons why I was disappointed in finding out that my second kid was going to be a boy was because I already had a boy. And I was like, a boy? I already know what that's like, Blah, you know? Then the second he came out, I felt like such a dummy because I was like, well, so what? He's a boy. That doesn't mean he's a clone of his older brother. And the older these kids get, the less they have in common. They could not be more opposite in every way, even like their physical shape of their bodies, <laughs> their coloring, their personality, like everything about these kids is different. And that's the other piece of this puzzle I think is super important is, first of all, be open to whatever the universe has in store for you and your child. And also let's not be trying to put a bunch of gender norms on our kids either. Like, so I finally did get my girl. She was my third kid. She came out, she was a girl. And for the first couple of years, like she was my little dress up doll because she didn't get to pick her clothes. I did. But if I hadn't had my head on straight about this, like fantasy I'd always had about having a daughter, like she and I would have spent like her entire life butting heads because she's not what I imagined. She's herself. She's a human being in her own right. And it's really none of my business who she becomes. And it's none of her business what my fantasy it was. That's not her job. That's not her responsibility. It has absolutely nothing to do with who she is as a person. It has a lot to do with whatever's going on inside my head. And that's about it. So it's super important to realize that whatever we have, ha the universe has in store for us, we don't know what it is. We need to stay open to it because if we become super attached to one way or another, we wind up 
creating a ton of power struggles between us and our real live, true, actual children instead of our imaginary fantasy children. And we miss out, we miss out on the magical, amazing beauty of whatever this crazy, miraculous, alchemical moment is that has created itself in front of our faces. You know, if I were constantly bummed out that Gigi doesn't like to wear makeup and she doesn't want to do girly girl stuff and she, you know, doesn't like reading like I do. And she was, she's just not this like imaginary girl that I made up in my head. I would miss out on the fact that she's first of all, a badass. She's like a crazy athlete. She's got, you know, sass and self-awareness coming out the yin yang. Like Gigi is an incredible person who has absolutely nothing to do with the person I thought I wanted to parent or imagined I would parent or whatever. And the same thing with River. If I were so disappointed in the fact that he's a boy instead of a girl, I would miss out on this incredible, strong, stubborn, confident, hilarious person that he actually is. So I don't know if that's helpful, but the first piece of the puzzle is to please give yourself permission to feel whatever you felt. Like there's no way I would have been able to, to receive river with the openness and love that I did when he was born. If I hadn't first given myself permission to be really sad about this imaginary person that he wasn't. And I did, I cried probably for like four days straight and felt sorry for myself. And just like you, I felt guilty for feeling sorry for myself because yeah, he was healthy and beautiful. And we were so lucky to have this like perfect, amazing baby on the way. And no matter how much you tell yourself, you shouldn't feel something you still do. And so I did still feel, feel sad and I had to give myself permission to feel how I felt. So that's my first piece of advice is don't second guess how you feel. You just feel that way. There's nothing you can do to stop it. The only thing, the only way out is through. So the only way that this feeling is going to shift and adjust is for you to give it permission to exist and for you to feel it and process it. So that's, that's point number one. And then at some point when you're on the other side of that processing, some of the other stuff I said might be helpful. The whole thing about missing out on who this person is and staying open and reminding ourselves that we don't actually really know what we're getting at all, no matter what an ultrasound says. Hopefully all of that stuff can um, land with you after you've given yourself permission to just feel how you feel. Okay. I hope that was a helpful answer. Total non sequitur for the episode topic, but that's how it goes sometimes. And I look forward to talking to all of y'all next week. Bye. The episode is over, but there's more waiting for you. You can grab my free workbook, Getting Kids to Listen the First Time, that walks you through the fundamental principles I teach all of my clients and applies them to this very universal parenting challenge. So if you're sick of repeating yourself all day long or just want to learn more about my style, you'll definitely want to go to bit.ly slash kids who listen. And if you're ready to work with me, let's meet. Set up a free call at bit.ly slash Kaplan call and let's create an action plan that gets you exactly where you want to go. And of course, links to all this goodness are in the show notes. Thanks for joining and I'll see you next time.